I never really got a feeling I belonged anywhere, always. It seems as if I was an outside looking in. Not really being part of a family, yeah, so that's kind of... Life was different growing up because everybody's like family orientated, and I'm not. There was never any major problems that they made me turn to alcohol. Good at school and I had dreams and aspirations of becoming a doctor one day. I had decent friends then, they were all good at school, along with me. I decided, no, there was other pals, you know, they were out having a good time smoking and drinking, you're 15, 16 year old. and. I thought, that, that's for me, you know, they're all having a great time, I'm going to try that. We lived in a big house, went to a nice school, we could do things. Then my parents separated in primary seven, and that's when it all went downhill. I mean, to begin with, I was just a social drinker. I worked, I had relationships, friends. And then I started drinking a hell of a lot more, and it became more and more of a part of my life. I was 11, I found out it was fostered. Got to feel that I wasn't really welcome in the house that I was fostered in. I struggled with the cops, so I kind of started stealing and drinking at shops and led to me <laughs> taking drugs, yeah, which led to me thieving to pay for it. And I went up a wee place just up the back of here, the Cannon Hill. Friday, Saturday night, that became the, the local pub for us at 16 year old. I started academy, started getting into trouble, had the brains, but just didn't use it. So then I started experimenting with drugs. My drug of choice was acid, because like, for 12 years I was something different. I didn't have to really think about anything. My first drug was actually alcohol, and that was like half bottles of vodka at 13 years old. Then it was a hash, then it was ecstasy. Got flung out of high school, went to college, then I'd drop out, then I'd get a job, drop out, uh, then it was cocaine. Started using heroin at 27, when my daughter was two and a half. She all finished, I got kicked out, and that was it. The dreams of being a doctor were away. And it's all hindsight, the reflection when you look back. You can start to pinpoint then where things started to unravel a bit. So for the age of 15, that was me, high as a kite. And then the day I'd look back and forget half the things that I have done, people hated me. I'd done things I'd never repeat. You know, the police and the end meant missing, you got a chap out the door and it's, so it must, who were you? Must be you. Somebody gives your name because it's kind of a guy with no family. I spent a good part of my teenage years and early 20s, got to court. Everybody told me I was getting to jail. My lawyer told me I was getting to jail. Played the system and I got off, which probably made me worse. Looking back now, I probably should have gone to jail, that maybe it helped me, but at the time I thought, superb. Trouble with the police, 36 year old. Never been in trouble in my life, you know, and now I started to come in police cells, you know, and court appearances every week, basically, maybe three times in the one week. Of course, prison as well. That's been ongoing, really, for the last 12 years. I've been sort of, been involved with the sort of criminal justice system, but that's been drink. It's all been related to the drink. The police left me, it was, I don't know how I was in jail. I got away with it. My heroin addiction got that bad. I gave my wee daughter to her dad yeah, as I started injecting, and the years just basically flew past. My wee boy was about one, that was basically kind of the last time I've seen him. I've seen him since, but I think I've only seen him once in about the last eight years. I found myself apologising to people all the time because of the way I was behaving through the drink and how unreliable I was. I don't actually mean remember, but it's 20 to 30. I've missed it somehow. The drinking was every day, all day, during the night, 24 hours a day, basically. My dad passed away and I took that really, uh, I say I took it really bad, but I never showed any emotion, no tears, no nothing. And that was, I was numb. A big thing happened to me, but I never stopped me drinking. I came up to Scotland about six years ago. It was great at first, isn't that? You think, I'll, I'll move somewhere else for a start, a change in that. But you just take your problem with you. It goes with you. It's part of you. Drugs made me feel kind of as if I belonged to them. That was my kind of comfort blanket. Kind of way I escaped reality. And it made me forget all about home life. You're drinking to alleviate the sort of depression, to try to bring you out of the depression. It makes it worse, and it's just one big vicious circle. My job, you know, in the fire brigade, I was going places with that and I went off sick for about, <laughs> about two years because of my seizures and uh, my eyesight and that just all related to my alcohol, you know, the problems with that. 
So that was that. I was medically retired, 34 and retired. When I look back now, I think, yeah, I had a problem because it was either drink or ecstasy or coke and it started off at the weekends and then it just led to addiction. It's a gradual, insidious process. So it takes over you without you noticing. I was at self-harm and taking razor blades to my wrist, you know, tying belts around my neck. That became life and I kind of woke up one day and I thought, life's crap. Yeah. So I thought, well, it must be drugs. So I gave drugs up when I was 28. As years went on, I got quieter and quieter and done less and stopped doing it. And yeah, my mental health just kind of deteriorated, yeah, which led to me losing my job. Yeah. But at that point, I kind of knew it was time to take me in life. I went out a wee walk one day and stopped breathing, my heart stopped. And I woke up in intensive care three to four days later, you know. And that was like too much alcohol in my system, that, that was the danger. Two years ago, I got rushed into hospital and nearly lost my legs, so I was lying in hospital thinking, wake up, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to lose your leg, or you're going to die. There I was, I was lying in hospital, and I was looking around me, and I was wondering what the hell I was there for. I actually felt as if I was wrong for being there because this was something I'd done to myself. November the 5th, I thought, right, can I be bored anymore? So I waited around to see. I got about waist deep and I froze because it was the middle of winter and it was Baltic. I don't know how long I was in there for. Somebody shouted, come here. Look, I spoke for a wee minute and then I get rid of him. Uh, I'm back sat at the wall and I seen the car lights driving out and come back and I thought he'd come back in but he'd phone the balls. And started going to smart meetings and that was a big turnabout in my life. That, that really saved me. February this year, two weeks before my 40th birthday, I thought, nah, but if this is what life is, I don't want to be part of this life anymore. I made the decision to come into recovery. That's has where I've been for the past nearly seven months now. I spoke to the psychiatrist, I met the doctors, and I got medication for my mental health. And I, I promised folk I'd give things a go. A support worker I had decided, why do you not go and try a recovery cafe? So I went and the cafe swallowed. For that day, I started volunteering there. I've never looked back. It's been excellent for me. I finally admitted I needed help, so this worker came in and I thought, how can she help me? But it ended up, she got me to groups, which I love. For there, I went to Cafe Solas and all the volunteers in there as well. I went to a winner's group, which is women in North Ayrshire group. That was brilliant. I used to compete swimming when I was younger, so I started going swimming half a mile and going for a sauna twice a week. And I started going to an art group and then I started volunteering in Cafe with Lance. And ever since I started my, my path in recovery, it's been great. I've done a lot, I do a lot of volunteering and that, yeah, which helps a wee bit of a boy. I've stopped smoking through attending a football project, Football for You. I joined a jogging group yeah, on a Monday night. And through the jogging group, I've done a half marathon, which is quite significant because I ran by the bit where I tried to commit suicide, and it was the first time we'd done here since then. I've been involved with Twilight Basketball. I went along and done a, a talk to the kids about drugs and crime. And so I've been kept busy all the years, and I always said I wouldn't be here, but I'm still here. I sort of feel my role now is to sort of encourage others, to help others, to assist other people who are going through similar sort of problems as well. I've been sectioned under mental health. I feel a guy that was a good job, you know, had a good career, and then what? Lost it all? Why? Because I picked up alcohol. The only reason I'm still here is uh, because of somebody else. It leaves me thinking, was it still the right decision? Because I still feel the same way at times. Some days are hard, some days are, are no hard. Every day is still a battle, but it's a battle inside my head. It's not a battle with Andy, it's a battle with me. I'm not quite sure of life's for me yet. I'm still deciding on that. It's still quite empty life, and I don't know if that's enough. All the time until, so I'm still healing now, but we'll wait and see. Alcohol, you know, it, it doesn't play any part of my life now, and it, I can, I can't say it never will, but I've no intentions of allowing it back into my life. There is light at the end of the tunnel, so if I've done it, anybody else can do it. As I say, recovery is a journey, and I intend to enjoy it.